food allergy classification. Food hypersensitivity can be divided into immune mediated food allergy and non immune mediated food allergy. The immune mediated food allergy can be Ig mediated or non Ig mediated. We can use this simple classification to divide food hypersensitivity in immune mediated food allergy that can be Ig mediated or not, and non immune mediated food allergy. It's important to make a distinction between food allergy and food intolerance. Allergy is an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reprodu reproducibly on exposure to a given food. So every time that the person, person eats that specific kind of food, he has the same reaction. Food intolerance is a non-immune reaction that includes metabolic, toxic, pharmacologic and undefined mechanisms. For example, histamine can cause ADH. The data, um, the data present in literature are generally supporting an increase in prevalence in food allergy, and specifically 8% in children and 5% in adults. The risk factors are Atopy is the first one. We know that atopy is the genetic predisposition to produce Ig against common antigens present in the environment, such as pollen on, or house dust mite. Other possible risk factors are factors that increase the absorption of proteins, such as exercise and shades and alcohol. The factors that increase the severity of reactions, such as asthma comorbidity, that is why children with food allergy and concomitant asthma should have an, epi an epinephrine out injector to be able to treat a severe reaction. We have also potential rectifiable risk factors such as vitamin D insufficiency, unhealthy dietary fat, obesity, increased hygiene and timing to of exposure to foods. For example, in the USA, the increased exposure to peanuts during the first year of life is associated with an increased development of allergies. The pathogenetic mechanism. The real food allergy is an IgE-mediated mechanism and it is a typical allergic reaction with an acute onset. The clinical manifestations are urticaria angedema. Urticaria is characterized by the presence of wheels that last few minutes to few hours and finally disappear without leaving any sign. Angedema is instead a swelling of the deeper part of the skin. We have also oral allergy syndrome, which is characterized by itching at the level of the oral mucosa that follows the ingestion of food. When the patient ingests this, this food starts to feel itching inside the, man, the mouth. We have also rhinitis, asthma, so the person can have a respiratory symptom after food ingestion. Can have anaphylaxis, which is the most severe form of allergic reaction to food Ig mediated. We have food associated exercise induced anaphylaxis, which is a very particular clinical entity and it is characterized by the fact that the food alone is not enough to cause anaphylactic reaction, but also very strong and heavy exercise concomitants should be present. After this typical Ig mediated hypersensitivity, we have some clinical entities that combine Ig mediated and some mediated mechanisms. Typically, they are atopic dermatitis, which is an inflammation of the skin that is triggered by many factors, and especially by some food in children. We have eosinophilic gastroenteropathies, it is an eosinophilic esophagitis and gastroenteritis. And in these patients, it's always, it's always very, it's always useful to perform an allergic assessment because some persons have an association between the ingestion of some food and the inflammation of the GI tract. Behind this, there are some cell-mediated food hypersensitivity reactions, which are mainly happening in children and usually due to milk ingestion and are represented by dietary protein enterocolitis, dietary protein proctitis. Here you can see urticaria, which um, typically comes and go and doesn't last more than 24 hours. Here we see angedema which is characterized by swelling of the skin, but it occurs more deeply into the skin compared to urticaria. In children, the most common foods implied in food allergies are milk, eggs and peanuts, while in adults, milk and eggs are not usually present. This means that in adults, we can become tolerant to some foods we were previously, previously intolerant to. 
And when a little child receives a diagnosis of allergy to eggs or milk, he needs to be reassessed at the age of six, for example, to understand if tolerance has occurred and the food can be reintegrated in his diet. Other foods that become very important in adults are all the nuts and derivatives, fish and shellfish, with associated to exercise and sesame, in particular associated with anaphylaxis. We have also food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis, which is a condition typically presenting more often in teenagers and young adults. When exercise is performed 10 minutes to 4 hours after food ingestion, a 10 minutes to 1 hour or 10 minutes to 1 hour before it. So you either uh, before or after food. There are two major causes that are shellfish and wet and also lipid transfer protein that is an allergen contained in a lot of vegetables. The patient presents all the typical signs of anaphylaxis which are urticaria, angedema, respiratory and gastrointestinal signs and anaphylaxis. This condition in general happens just when food ingestion is associated with exercise and this can be explained by the fact that exercise increases the absorption of food proteins. Food, allergy, food allergic subjects were divided in two groups. Type 1, where food is the first sensitizer. The allergy reaction is mainly given by fish, shrimp, snail, egg, meat, and anazaki, anisakis. It is a parasite that infects fish. Fruits and vegetables and cereals. We have type 2, which is characterized by pollen food allergy syndrome, latex fluid, uh, latex fluid allergy syndrome, celery, muggo, or spice syndrome. Lipid transfer protein. Lipid transfer protein is a group of allergens that cause oral allergic syndromes, but could also cause general, generalized reactions from urticaria to anaphylaxis. And the characteristic of LTP is that it is stable at high temperature and to pepsinogen. So despite cooking food, you can still have the reaction. This is different compared to other kinds of allergic proteins that are not stable at high temperature and peps in digestion, and so they could eat uncooked cooked food, but not raw food. There is a high level of LTP in the peel of fruit and vegetables, and particularly peach is very rich of them. And we also use it as a marker to test it. Peach is the marker for sensitization to LTP. This sensitization is not due to a cross reactivity to aero allergen, and so it can occur in a person who has not a respiratory allergy. When you perform Ig assessment of specific Ig, there is the possibility to assess LTP using Pro P3. Profilins. Profilin is a different allergen that can be found mainly in vegetables. We spoke about it last time. Okay. If present, typical sy typically symptoms are oral allergic syndrome with raw, raw fruits and vegetables. Profilin is a panallergen widespread among fruits and vegetables. We suspected sensitization when we found a, uh, a widespread allergy to fruit and vegetables. Diagnosis. When a person comes and reports some symptoms that are specific for fruit allergy, we should follow some steps. Clinical history in particular is important to ask about recognized triggers such as physical exercise and SAIDs and other possible ones that usually the patient doesn't tell you if you don't specifically ask it. We have physical examination, which many times is normal because in the majority of cases the patient is coming when he's fine and without the reaction in the acute situation. So basically physical examination is just to exclude other possible types of disease. We have SPT skin prick test. It's performed with commercial extracts and fresh food when the extract is not available. We have total plus specific Ig assessment, performed when we didn't reach a diagnosis in other ways and after in vivo analysis has been performed. Natural extracts and recombinant allergens are tested. We have elimination diet after three, four weeks. After the, this first battery of tests, if we think to have reached a, a diagnosis, we proceed with the elimination of the source of allergy from the diet for three to four weeks and observe if the patient has no more reactions. A food challenge, which can be made open, that is when both the patient and the doctor know what is given to the patient. 
can be single blind, that is when the doctor knows what he's giving to the patient, but the patient doesn't know. And finally, double blind, but neither, when neither the patient nor the physician knows what the patient is taking. The double blind approach is the gold standard for food allergy diagnosis. We have also another uh, also elimination from the diet, and we have other tests that are not used in the routine, but that can be used in some specific cases that are the Isaac test, that is a highly technological tool for revealing the IgE antibody profile of the subject and measures IgE antibodies for 112 components for 51 allergens. It could be, this could be helpful when all the other tests were not convincing and you want a complete allergen profile of the subject. This test actually is more useful for all the other people who are not allergologists and need a more detailed and standardized way to arrive to the diagnosis because actually most of the times for allergologists the other tests are enough. We have a basophil activation test that evaluates the flow cytometry, the basophil activation by flow that evaluates by flow cytometry the basophil activation when put in contact with an allergic allergenic stimulus and we usually see an increase in expression of CD63 and CD203. It is interesting when the mechanism is uncertain and when we suspect, for example, that the hypersensitivity is given by specific IgG. Activation of basophils can be given by different mechanisms, and when IgE has not been reassessed, we can suspect that there are, that there are other, me other mechanisms involved, and typically in these cases the test is not looking for the mechanism involved but directly to the results of hypersensitivity and so to the activation of effector cells. Another test used specifically in children is the ATOP patch test and it consists in putting some food on the back and leave it for 48 to 72 hours and observe if there is a delayed reaction. This kind of test is useful, very useful when you suspect for example an association between food ingestion and atopic dermatitis or when you suspect a correlation between food ingestion and gastrointestinal delayed symptoms. It's very important to remember that all other, all other tests that are performed to diagnose food intolerance are not scientifically proven, and they only create problems to patients because they lead to some restrictive diets that are not scientifically useful for the patient. Many patients that arrive to us have already undergone these types of tests that however are totally not useful, such as Vega test, Bria test, cytotoxic test, iridology error analysis and specific IgG for foods. Food allergy management. Once the diagnosis of food intolerance is proven, the person has to exclude this food. When it occurs in children, particularly with milk and eggs, you may use some specific oral tolerance pro induction protocols. And for example, tolerate this food before the natural tolerance would have occurred. There are a lot of studies going on in this specific field of research involving specific chemotherapy, sublingual or epicutaneous, and modified hypoallergenic foods. For example, for peanuts, they are reaching this goal creating a peanut that is lacking the principal allergens. We have also drug hypersensitivity reactions. We have, for example, adverse dr drug reaction, which can be classified based on pathogenesis in predictable and non-predictable. The predictable symptoms are intolerance or idiosyncrasy, and we have to know it because if the patient tells us, for instance, that when he takes aspirin, he has nose bleedings, it is something predictable and expected, while if the patient tells you that when he takes aspirin, if he has asthma, it is not predictable and can be defined as an unpredictable or hypersensitivity reaction. In this case, not predictable reactions are divided into allergic and pseudoallergic, but however, in both, the immune-mediated mechanism is involved. As we said last time, also drug reactions can be explained by a type 1 IgE-mediated mechanism with immediate reactions and also by type 4 or cell-mediated mechanisms. In a lot of cases in the field of drug allergies, all the mechanisms are associated and we are therefore not able to make strict divisions. 
we have uh, drug allergy mechanisms. Speaking about mechanisms, we can find Ig mediated symptoms and cell mediated sim mechanisms that could also be very severe reaction plus less commonly IgG and complement mediated reactions. Ig mediated drug reactions can be urticaria, angioedema, anaphylaxis, bronchospasm. The main types of T cell mediated drug allergy are maculopapular exanthem, Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic, toxic epidermal necrolysis, acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, drug reaction with tesinophilia and systemic symptoms, nephritis, pancreatitis, colitis, pneumonitis, and hepatitis. Less commonly, we can have IgG and complement-mediated drug allergy, and in this case, we prevalently find blood cell dyscrasia, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, agranulocytosis, vasculitis, drug-induced autoimmunity in SLE and pemphigus. We have also drug hypersensitivity reaction timing, which can be subdivided Drug hypersensitivity reactions can be subdivided into immediate when occur within one hour from the assumption of the drug, delayed when they occur after 24 hours, and accelerated if, if after one hour but before 24 hours. We have said that the main symptoms of the immediate reaction are the one listed here in the image. Now we have said that the main symptoms of the immediate reaction are ur urticaria and anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock. While for what regards non-delayed immune reaction, the main symptom is maculopapular rash. These three symptoms together account for 88% 80 of the reactions. Epidemiology. The main drugs implied in hypersensitivity reactions are the one listed here in the image. The two main important ones uh, are beta-lactams and NSAIDs. We will see that in beta-lactams allergy we have, in beta-lactams allergy, we have a really IgE-mediated hypersensitivity mechanism, while in NSAIDs it's not an IgE-mediated mechanism in the majority of cases. Other antibiotics are involved in 21.7% 21, of cases, and they account mainly for sulfa allergies and quinolones allergy. Then we can have radio contrast media, paracetamol, corticosteroids, local anesthetics, opiates, and others. IG clinical presentation. We have a rapidly, rapidly appearing urticaria, rapidly appearing angioedema, mostly periorbital oral genital swellings with moderate pruritus in associate, association with generalized urticaria. We have gastrointestinal symptoms like cramps, diarrhea, and vomiting. We have anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. We have T-cell mediated exanthems like bullous exanthema, maculopapular exanthema, acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which is the most severe form. Acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis is a severe drug reaction, but if promptly recognized and the drug is suspended, we can recover in a couple of days. Many drugs can induce this type of reaction, but mainly, again, antibiotics and NSAIDs. We have erythema multiforme, which is a target lesion of ar or iris lesions that appear within 72 hours period and begins on their extremities. The lesions remain in a fixed location for at least 7 days and then start to heal. We have dress, which is instead characterized, which is a different type of drug in reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. It's characterized by an itchy rash, fever, xenophilia, lymphadenopathy, liver toxicity, and kidney failure. In a lot of cases, herpes virus 6 seems to be involved in this severe reaction to drugs. Usually, antibiotics are the cause of these reactions, and diagnosis may be confused with the normal symptoms of the infection. We have Steven Johnson syndrome, which is characterized by an involvement of skin, but particularly of oral and genital mucosa. It is a life-threatening reaction and is not rare. It's very important to check the mucosa when we have a reaction on the skin. This syndrome is mainly linked to the use of antibiotics, anticonvulsants and NSAIDs. In this case, the best treatment we can use is to treat these, patient, these people exactly in the same way as burned patients. FLL syndrome, which is quite similar to Steven Johnson, but while in Steven Johnson 
you have less than 30% of this epithelialization of the skin. In Liel, we have more than 30% of this epithelialization, of, and obviously, the risk to die is much higher. Mortality in severe delayed drug hypersensitivity reactions. Mortality in severe delayed drug hypersensitivity reaction is non negligible, and you can see that in this kind of toxic epidermal necrolysis, that is Lyell syndrome, it can reach up to 30%, so very high percentage. The most important thing in this kind of severe drug reaction is to assess the responsible drug and is not and is not so easy in a hospital setting because many times the patient is taking a large number of medications all recently introduced to treat the infection. Basically you have to decide what is more severe for the patient, either eliminate some drugs or let the reaction proceed. It's really an uneasy situation to be managed. We have also drug variant interactions. In the field of drug reactions, interactions between viruses and drugs are very common, and the prototype of this kind of situation is the mononucleosis rash in a patient treated with ampicillin or amoxicillin. This is very common between children with ABV, where ABV is mimicking a bacterial infection, and so usually an antibiotic therapy is initiated usually penicillin, and the virus can, virus can accelerate the sensitization to penicillin. So in these cases, when in the clinical history the patient says that he started amoxicillin therapy, he developed a rash and after has been diagnosed with EBV infection, even if all the exam next examinations result negative, you have to be very care careful and suspect everything because it is probable that it will be sensitized and it is better to avoid the drug. When the patient arrives with a suspected drug reaction, we need to exclude all the possible, other possible differential diagnosis and reactions for infections, etc. Anticonvulsants they are one of the major causes of hypersensitivity reactions, together with antibiotics and SEDs and iodinated contrast media. They can cause very severe manifestations such as Dress, Steven Johnson, and 10. In the real life, we see many cases of patients treated in neurosurgery with anticonvulsant drugs, and that shows hypersensitivity problems. The three main drugs used are carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and phenobarbital. Anticonvulsants can cause mild to very severe manifestations like the HIS and DRESS and, and the St Steven Johnson and 10. Anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome can occur in one over 3,000 treated persons. Immunogen immunogenetic risk factors are defined in Chinese. Symptoms differ from drug to drug. Exanthema, hepatitis, nephritis, fever, signs of capillary leak, syndrome similar to symptoms observed in a cytokine storm. We have laboratory tests, so lymphocytosis and isoniophys in more than 70% of cases, high cytokines, IL-5 and IL interferon gamma, in serum increase in ALT-AST and in serum creatinine. Often in the third week there is the reappearance of symptoms in the absence of drug intake due to reactivation of HHV6 and other herpes viruses, CMV, EBV, HHV, 6, 7. For treatment, uh, we use corticosteroids for hepatitis. Use of high dose IgG replacement therapy is controversial. We have also beta-lactams antibiotics, which are the most frequent causes of allergic reactions, penicillin, cephalosporin, and amoxicillin. They are able to cause more frequently IgE-mediated reactions, but also cell-mediated allergic diseases. The patient has allerg allergen sensitization for the whole category of drugs, and we need to pay attention to cross-reactivity. We have beta-lactams. Beta-lactams are 2-8% of hospitalized patients develop allergies. They are often able to cause all forms of drug allergies, Cross-reactivity between penicillin and cephalosporins because of a common ring is present. For 11% in immediate reaction with documented type 1 allergy, 
predominant linear list studies for type for first generation cephalosporins very rare and negligible in delayed reactions recommendation for skin testing to penicillins and suspected cephalosporin cross reactivity cross reactivity exists at a low rate and it is important to remember that if after some years we will find in front of a patient that really needs the drug it's better to perform some test in order to exclude the cross reactivity with the risk that the patient has become allergic also to the similar family in a patient who has already presented a typical Ig mediator reaction to one of them it's better to go deeply and test him for their possible allergies in particular for penicillin the risk of an Ig mediated allergy exists and so even if it's not a, if it's a minor reaction you should perform a step by step exam administration of it if a person comes to you saying that 10 years before he developed a rash after some days of amoxicillin treatment and they stopped it, uh, then you have some, some problems. In fact, if the reaction continued the years before, the subject, subject can also result in negative tests because the farther you go from the reaction, the more skin prick tests and specific IG disappears. So you need to perform twice the test in order to allow the system to resensitize himself and to reset, retest him after one month in order to verify that the resensitization has not occurred. You decide to resensitize, resensitize, resensitize a patient also depending on other factors like the age of the person and you try to do it just if the patient really needs the drug otherwise you can shift to another ex drug without problems because it takes a lot of time and sensitization can be lost during years but just upon uh, testing it while in reality it is still present to sum up basically you need to check if there is no possibility that the patient despite being negative to the test, will respond again to the drug creating an allergic reaction. We have also sulfonamides, such as sulfamethoxazole, mainly given in combination with trimetoprim cotrimoxazole. Around 2-4% of hospitalized patients develop allergies, but up to 50% of HIV-infected patients treated for pneumocystis gyrovesi prophylaxis uh, sulfamethoxazole can become an apten, able to cause all forms of drug allergies. T cell reactions, exantema 4A and 5D, mainly due to a 2PI concept, namely a direct stimulation of TCR by, sulf by sulfamethoxazole. We also need to remember that there are a lot of drugs containing sulfa components, from diuretics to antibiotics. And so when subject shows this type of reaction, you should advise him to perform tests for whatever kind of these drugs sulfa components containing. Perioperative anaphylaxis. It occurs in 1 over 10,000, 2,000 anesthetic procedures and 1 over 6,500 6, administrations of neuromuscular blocking agents. Symptoms reach from mild urticaria to death due to anaphylactic shock. 3-10% of perioperative death are due to such reactions. The severe reactions may involve only one system, most commonly the cardiovascular system. About 60% of the immediate hypersensitivity reactions occurring during anesthesia are Ig mediated but 50% occur in persons not previously exposed to anesthesia. 28% of recurrent symptoms in the following eight years. In these cases we hypothesize, we can hypothesize the causes of perioperative anaphylaxis. We can have MBAs, so neuromuscular blocking agents are accounting for the highest prevalent percentage from 50-70% of cases. We have latex, this is the second place where we find found latex allergy. We have antibiotic, which is the third ranking place for antibiotic allergy development.
we have less common causes like colloids, proteinin, protamine, antiseptics and dyes. We have also radio contrast media. These are common, becoming more and more often causes of hypersensitivity reaction because of their widespread using the clinical practice. The most commonly involved ones are especially iodinated contrast media performed in CT scan. Contrast media are widely applied. There are three iodinated phenyl ring structures rapidly excreted by the urine. They cause immediate, sometimes even lethal reactions. These were more frequent with ionic uh, um, contrast media. The newer non-ionic dimers ca cause less side effects, less than 1%. But delayed, most mild, mostly mild reactions occur with them as well, mainly with non-ionic dimers in 2-4% of cases. About 50% of, of contrast media induced Im immediate and delayed reactions appear upon the first exposure. Tradermal skin test with a battery of contrast media can be positive with immediate and delayed reactions. The highest sensitivity is seen 2-6 months after the reaction. Cross-reactivity is very common in delayed, less common in immediate reactions. Skin tests may help in the identification of an alternative tolerated contrast medium. And seeds hypersensitivity. You can have pseudo-allergic reactions, not Ig mediated, which are reactions due to their mechanism of action of cyclooxygenase inhibition with a consequent increase of leukotrienes. You have allergic reactions that are Ig mediated. Type 5 is urticaria and jedema to a single NSAID. Type 6 is anaphylaxis to a single NSAID, not aspirin. Incidence of aspirin hypersensitivity in the general population is 0.6 to 2.5%. In adult asthmatics uh, is 4.3% to 11%. Clinical phenotypes are NSAID aspirin as an exacerbated respiratory disease or aspirin-induced asthma. We can have an underlying asthma, sinusitis, nasal polyposis in the Weedle Sumter triad. We can have aspirin, uh, so aspirin induced urticaria and jedema. We can have underlying chronic idiopathic urticaria, where we have NSAIDs induced urticaria and jedema anaphylaxis. So, hypothesize an EIG mediated mechanism. We have no underlying risk factors like in NSAIDs, single reactors. We can have genetic risk factors like in IHLA associations and genetic polymorphisms in aspirin sensitive asthma and urticaria and jedema in certain populations. The slides below we can see and understand which tests are available before immediate and non immediate reactions. In vitro testing acute phase consists in the assessment of tryptase, that is the main mediator released by histamine during immediate reactions. In the late phase, instead, after the ending of the reactions, you could perform assessment of specific Ig, but only for few drugs, and in particular for beta-lactam drugs, it is not available for other kind of drugs. Other in vitro possible tests are the basophil activation test and the lymphocyte transformation test, and we will discuss about these two later or in the lesson. Later on in the lesson. In vivo tests include the skin prick test and challenge. So in the acute phase, in vitro, we can use serum tryptase and plasma histamine, while in the late phase, we can use specific serum specific Ig, basophil activation test, or lymphocyte transformation test. While in vivo, we can perform a skin test or challenge. This for immediate reactions to beta lactams. In non immediate reactions to beta lactams, uh, in vitro we can use in the acute phase Coombs test, hemolysis test, complement factors assays, circulating immune complex assays. In the late phase, in vitro we can use lymphocyte transformation test, while in vivo we can use delayed reading skin tests, patch test, and challenge. Here in this table on the left, we can we have the representation of the time course of serum triptase, triptase, and you can see that at the beginning, after 60 minutes from the start of the reaction, we have uh, reached the peak of triptase, and then we start to descend after 90 minutes.
Triptase is a very useful marker for anaphylaxis and is used in routine settings because there is a quite wide range in which to use it. The contrary is true for plasma histamine that has a very narrow range of circulation in the blood and is not used because really low reliable. Triptase can instead be used for both anaphylaxis but also septic shock. So it's important to say that triptase is a marker of acute IgE mediated reactions and if you find it high during the reaction, you should perform a second measurement after its resolution. The reaction can be an isolated reaction in a normal patient with no other underlying pathology, but could also be to must, due to mast cells activation that could lead to the deposition of having some allergic reactions to pre the predispositions of having some allergic reactions. The determination of the trip test during the reaction is the first assessment we should do. If you find it over 20 micrograms per liter, you will have the confirmation of the allergic IG mediator reaction. And only when you perform it the second time, after a few days, you can understand if the value has gone back to normal range that is less than. Okay that is less than 10 micrograms per liter and be able to say if it was just an acute allergic reaction while if you find this value again elevated you are able to say that this subject can have a mast cell activation disorder. If this value is always constantly over 20 milligram, micrograms per liter the patient has to be studied with an osteomedullary biopsy with the suspect of mastocytosis. Systemic mastocytosis is always to be kept in consideration when triptase values are like this. So risk patients are where we have elevated baseline levels underlying mastocytosis, triptase levels more than 10 uh, micrograms per liter. Skin prick test. It's specific, sensitive, simple to perform, rapid, results are in 15-20 minutes and educational for the patient. Skin prick test for drugs is available, advisable especially in the case of antibiotics, anesthetics and contrast media. For NSAIDs it's not standardized and so it's better not to use it because we would like to avoid having some false positives or false negative results. In vivo tests include also intradermal skin test. Typically it is more sensitive than the skin prick test alone and it is performed when SPT is negative. So the first step is the skin prick test. And after it, if negative, if negative, we use intradermal skin test at increasing concentrations. It's more sensitive than skin prick test, main use false positive reactions. Main use systemic reactions and should be done only if the skin prick test is negative and the allergen is highly suspect. After this first step in, of in vivo diagnosis, you have to consider that for penicillins you have immediate reactions, drug-specific Ig tests, only for this specific kind of drugs. We have various ones. Also, basophil activation test is available and is a very helpful, helpful in vitro diagnostic tool, especially when no other tests are available, for example in the case of anesthetics or NSAIDs, when reactions are severe and you prefer to help the diagnosis with an in vitro test. Flow cytometric basophil activation tests, like fast flow cast or baso test, they are based on the flow cytometric evaluation of CD63 on blood basophils and activation molecule appearing following the incubation of blood basophils with drugs or other allergens in vitro. Beta lactams with a sensitivity of 50%, specificity of 93% when compared to FEA, etc. etc. We have also delayed reactions lymphocyte transformation test, which measures the proliferation of T cells to a drug in vitro. And this is not available in a routine setting, but it would be very helpful in a hypersensitivity reaction. So, in all cases where delayed T cell hypersensitivity mechanisms is involved, there is the only is the only in vitro analysis that could be helpful for the diagnosis. Advantage, it's applicable to many different drugs with different immune reactions as drug-specific T-cells are almost always involved in drug hypersensitivity reactions. Disadvantages are test per se is rather cumbersome and technically demanding and sensitivity is limited. In vivo test, 
instead include the patch test, which is the same we use for contact allergic dermatitis, so it is the only test routinely performed in the diagnosis of delayed reactions. Other drug tests are po drug patch tests are positive in 30 to 50 percent of patients that who have developed a cutaneous drug reaction. The advantages are usually positive in AG, AGEP, maculopapular rash, photodermatosis, lichenoid rash, fixed drug eruption, frequently positive for beta-lactam antibiotics, especially amoxicillin, cotrimoxazole, corticosteroids, heparin derivatives, perinstamycin, carbamazepine, diltiazem, diazepam, hydroxine, hydroxyzine, so the ephedrine terad tetrazepam. These advantages are low sensitivity at best 50% and lack of standardized test reagents. We have drug provocation test indicated first of all to exclude hypersensitivity in a non-suggestive history or non-specific symptoms and so when the patient is referring some symptoms that you don't think linked to hypersensitivity but you are not able to exclude it completely. So in the indications are Exclude hypersensitivity in non-suggestive history or non-specific symptoms. Provide safe pharmacologically and or structurally non-related drugs in proven hypersensitivity, such as in beta-lactam antibiotics. Exclude cross-reactivity of related drugs in proven hypersensitivity, such as in cephalosporin, such as cephalosporin in a, pelicin, in a pelicinin allergic. And definitive diagnosis in suggestive history with negative, non-conclusive or non-available allergological tests. Contraindications are pregnant women, comorbidity where DPT may provoke stimulation situation be beyond medical control, such as in acute infection, uncontrolled asthma, underlying cardiac hepatic renal disease, then immunobolus drug eruption, severe systemic in initial reaction. The treatment is stop the suspected drug, drugs, resuscitation in serious reactions like airway breathing circulation in anaphylaxis. The drugs that can be used are antihistamine, can be IV or oral, intramuscular epinephrine for anaphylaxis, systemic corticosteroids, I dose IVIG, one gram per kilogram per day for two days for early 10 and uh, Steven Johnson syndrome overlapped and 10 emollients and skin care hydration and prevention of skin super infection 10 intravenous immunoglobulin can be very important to reinforce the immune system in this period in, in this period in which we have a very high risk of death the sensitization the concept is that it is mainly useful in some situations in which the culprit drug has to be administered, for example, in the case of chemotherapeutics, such as platinum salts. From the oncological point of view, if the drug is really giving a better profile to the patient, there are some proposals to administer the drug to desensitize the patient. This is done just in the case in which the drug cannot be substituted. Making a patient tolerant to a drug he she is, is allergic to when there are no reasonable alternatives contraindicated in system um, in uh, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome and 10 not contraindicated in anaphylaxis patients still considered allergic to the drug have a rapid desensitization with immediate hypersensitivity or a slow desensitization with a delayed hypersensitivity, alloporinol, sulfasalazine, TB drugs, and SMX. So skin allergies. We have contact allergic dermatitis, which is a cell-mediated hypersensitivity reaction, and it occurs some hours after the contact with culprit object. It's characterized by red itchy rash caused by substances that have come into contact with the skin, so an allergen. The all possible causes can be swaps, cosmetics, fragrances, jewelry, and also possibly an occupational disease. Main contact allergens tested with patch test could be metals, like nickel and chrome, dyes, for phenylenediamine, la latex, and substances used in latex processing, Topical drugs, formaldehyde, perf perfume, preservatives, 
like parabens. So as you can see there, they can be the cause of contact dermatitis on the lips because of the application of some product. And in the case of contact dermatitis, the inflammation is also going near the application site. For what regards the patch test, you are applying on the back a patch with all the different aptens and you keep it for 48 to 72 hours and you see that exactly in the place where allergens are put, you see a rash with vesicles. We have atopic dermatitis, which is a chronic inflammatory disease that affects the skin with a typical alternance of exacerbation and remission. So patients, the patients typically sometimes have dermatitis and sometimes are totally free from symptoms. It's a multifactorial disease involving a genetical predisposition plus an environmental interplay. The genetic factors include the genetic genetical predisposition for atopy and production of production of Ig in response to common environmental protein, a mutation in the gene responsible for filaggrin codification that is a protein present in the skin. And some mutations from, for these genes are very frequent in patients with atopic dermatitis and in patients that present problem of incomplete barrier of the skin. Atopic refers to the inherited tendency to produce Ig, sometimes associated with asthma and rhinitis. It's characterized by itchy rash and dryness of the skin. Prevalence of 10% of children less than 7 years, but it can also persist in adults, and when it persists in adults, we have more severe forms of atopic dermatitis, very difficult to treat. Major features are intense itching, characteristic rash in locations typical of the disease, in particular in children, we have a face involvement. In adolescents, we see the junction involvement of the arm and behind the knee, and in adults, we have mainly symptoms of the face. We have also chronic or repeatedly occurring symptoms and personal or family history of atopic disorders, so eczema, hay fever, asthma. The minor features are early age of onset, dry skin that may also have patchy scales or rough bumps, high levels of immunoglobulin E, an antibody in the blood, numerous skin creases on the palms and or foot involvement, inflammation around the lips, nipple eczema, susceptibility to skin infection, and positive allergy skin tests. There could be again some mutations in filaggrin genes that lead to permeability defects and a lot of common allergens are present in the environment. We have also chronic urticaria, which, uh, which is less when it lasts more than six weeks. In 60-80% of these, we have, have spontaneous urticaria. Most of the rest, 20%, have a physical urticaria. So dermatographism or cold urticaria. 50% of cases of, of spontaneous urticaria are idiopathic. The other 50% are autoreactive in nature and often have associated thyroid autoantibodies. Although spontaneous ur urticaria is not an allergy, in 10% of cases, symptoms are exacerbated by food ad additives especially sodium benzoate in fizzy drinks or tetrazine in food coloring, or aspirin and other NSAIDs. We have a slight female predominance and can, af can affect any age, although 50% present between the ages on of 20 and 40. 25% of patients have an atopic background, and the symptoms can be, although the condition may persist for several months or in some cases years, Individual lesions generally last between 30 minutes and 4 hours. Can have additional elements of physical urticaria such as dermatographism or delayed pressure urticaria. Angedema will affect some patients but is rarely life-threatening. As a natural history, 50% of patients with spontaneous urticaria can expect to be clear in 6 months, but some persist for years. There are also some blood tests to be performed. We have a blood cell count, PCR for suspect of infection, TSH and thyroid autoantibodies because in many cases chronic urticaria appears together with chronic autoimmune thyroiditis, electrophoresis and total Ig. Helicobacter pylori association and resolution after the eradication of the bacteria. When angedema exists, you should assess the complement C3 and C4-C1 inhibitors.
Once rutic has been excluded, you should perform intradermal reaction with autologous serum and plasma, and this allows us to perform diagnosis of autoreactive forms of chronic urticaria because it means that either in serum or in plasma you have some factors that induce the granulation of most of mast cells in the skin. As a therapy we can use antihistamine 1, so cetirizine, levocetirizine, loratadine, rupatadine, steroids like prednisone, methylprednisone, 0.5 mg per kilogram, Antileukotriene, Monteleucas 10 mg, Cyclosporin, 2.5 mg per kilogram, Anti-IgE, Omalizumab, it has been used but is not available yet in routine settings. It has been used in trials and up to now it seems to be very effective. And we have Osangedema due to ACE inhibitors or deficit in C1 inhibitor. When a patient arrives with Angedema and in particular with a localization in the oral mucosa, you have to think about ACE inhibitor anti-hypertensive drugs or a deficit in C1 inhibitor. The patient can have very se severe life-threatening reactions with the complete occlusion of the airways and this happens from mechanisms that involve not histamine but bradykinin. bradykinin. This explains also why the patient is not responsive to steroid treatment and needs more specific therapies. The therapy consists of suspension of the ACE inhibitor and the if hereditary forms ecatiband, which directly block directly blocks bradykinin auto injector.